بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So what I wanted to focus on today is really narrating Palestine in order for us to have both a grounding and understanding the history of Palestine and why centering Palestinian narrative and uh, uh, cause will have an impact on how we speak and deal with the current circumstances. Now, Palestine is one of the oldest places on earth. Right? Uh, if we think about the development civilizations, uh, we speak of Mesopotamia, we speak of the uh, Fertile Crescent, uh, speak of the Nile Valley. Uh, so the history of this region is uh, very extensive. Uh, there is the oldest olive trees, olive tree in the world, uh, is located in the area of Palestine. Some estimate the tree is to be 5,000 years. Uh, some put the tree at 6,500 years. It's still there. Uh, the Japanese actually did research did it at a much uh, 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 earlier period, and the tree still produces produces about 600 pounds of olives. A year, it's a, a national uh, heritage, uh, and still its owner uh, spends most of his day attending to this tree. And I say this because there are often this mistake that people begin narrating the history of Palestine or dealing with Palestine by pointing to the Zionist narrative, and Israel says we came to Palestine. 1000 BC, the time of David and Solomon. And even if you want to take it a little bit earlier to the time of Abraham, still what it does, it erases much of Palestine history where you have actually evidence of uh, a Neanderthal period. You have uh, discoveries much, much earlier. And we know that there is at least recorded history from 12,000 BC. When we are responding or beginning to say 1000 BC, this is centering and actually giving credence to uh, Zionist history. And we begin to narrate and argue about the history that they put, and you forget much of the history that was there. So we need to insist that the history of Palestine predates anyone that makes claim on today, especially from Israel and the Zionists. And we know that recorded history document that the earliest people to have lived in this area are the Canaanites. Right? So uh, there's been so much work on the Canaanites to uh, discover archaeologically every time there is a dig somewhere that looks at any artifacts, it's overwhelmingly the Canaanites is. Uh, the earliest inhabitants. And the Canaanites are one tree of the Arab people. Right? In Arabic, we say al Canaaniyun, right? the Canaanites. So in this sense, we need to insist that when we're dealing with the history of Palestine, the earliest people lived in there are the Canaanites. They're the ones that have uh, developed cultivation. They domesticated animals, uh, created uh, uh, canals for water, and then we could point to some of the earliest uh, recorded city in history is the city of Jericho, or in Arabic, Ariha. It is still as the first city in human history. Not in some history, it's the oldest city in human history. Now Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city. Uh, Jericho is the oldest city to have been uh, put together by human beings, right? And as such, we could speak of the history of that area. Now, many people begin to engage only with the biblical narrative because history tends to privilege written text, right? So the biblical narrative, actually, even if you take it as a historical text, setting aside the theology and so on, it says that Abraham migrated to Palestine. So Abraham is a native of uh, Mesopotamia, in the city of Ur. 
migrated and when he arrived in the area that is the land of the Canaanites, it was already inhabited. There were people in there. How do we know this? Because the biblical texts speak about Abraham. He lived as an alien among the Canaanites. He spoke the language of the Canaanites. He met the king of the Canaanites. So Abraham came in migration to Palestine, right? And uh, the, the area was inhabited. Then we are informed that Abraham was given a promise of the land. Now people try to understand this promise in ways that basically becomes identified through bloodline. Rather understanding this as a covenant of belief. Now Abraham himself did not think of the promise as usurping or taking the rights of people. Why? Because when he wanted to bury his family, he bought a property in the city of Al-Khalil. Right? People name, in English they say Hebron, the name of the city is Al-Khalil. Right? Which is one of the attributes of the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Khalilullah, the companion of Allah. So if Abraham understood the promise to be take over, take the land of people, he would not purchase something that is already belongs to him. I know sometimes logic is very difficult to come by these days, but that's the logical understanding in relations to the history of Palestine. And if we think about the successive uh, engagement with Palestine, almost every civilization, every power, have came to Palestine at one point or the other. Now, if we accumulatively look at the history of Palestine, actually the Egyptians had the longest history of Palestine in terms of ruling and governing Palestine. So, you know, if we accumulate the different periods, so much so, again, when we read the religious text, the uh, Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, he went to Egypt. He brought his family to Egypt. Uh, so the narrative about Egypt is well established, right? In, in both in the Quranic text, biblical text. Now the interesting part is that those who narrate uh, the uh, history of Israel, they try of the ancient period, as they came as a conquerors of the land, they try to exaggerate the state to make it a major power. It wasn't. We have at least the archaeological work, especially I think the work of Keith Whitelam, uh, who wrote a number of books, very good in terms of his archaeology, is there isn't mentioning about Israel in the region. So, if, you know, the Egyptians were a major power, uh, the Byzantine was a major power, the Persians were a major power. In those three powers, there is nothing written about this major power that comes out. It's as if you have the United States and Russia for 70 years, major powers, 200 years, 300 years from now, where still people will look at evidence and they will see something written about their rivalries and we'll have evidence. So you can't say that there is a major power and yet the three major centers of power have nothing written, very only one reference in Egyptian texts. Right? And more importantly, it was a state, again, in the classical sense, that came as an occupying force at the time. Right? And ma mainly in the hills, where still the Canaanites were present, the Hittites were present, and other tribal configurations were there. So it's very important you discuss, talk about Palestine with centering a longer history, the Canaanites, and how it was a crossroad of civilization from the earliest period. The second point to make. Zionism was not born in the Muslim world. Zionism as, because Zionism is, is an ideology that is the foundation of the modern state of Israel. Zionism was born in the Western world and in reaction to European anti-Semitism. Right, so if we trace the history of Europe, Europe consistently been anti-Semitic. Uh, you could go from the earliest history, you could pass through the Crusades, you could pass through the Inquisition, you could pass through the expulsion from uh, Europe, you could pass through the 18th century, 19th century, and the 20th century. European anti-Semitism was and continued to be a feature 
in relation to how they treat or relate to the Jewish population. So Zionism is a Western emerging movement as a reaction and in response to European anti-Semitism. Why is this important? Because Jewish populations lived among the Muslims. Now, all the Jewish populations actually lived in the Muslim world. We still have some of the oldest Jewish populations in Palestine, right around the city of Nablus, or the old Jewish community in Jerusalem. They're not Zionist, right? Zionism was not born among the Jews in Iraq, or the Jews in Yemen, or in Syria, or in Iran, right? We did not have the same problems, both racially and theologically, that Christian Europe have. One is they insist on whiteness, which is again, that continues to be white supremacy, is a foundational within European society. They cannot live with the other, racial others. That's been the main feature. And the second is that they have always projected theologically on the Jewish population by claiming that they were responsible for the uh, uh, death of Jesus, but this was translated constantly of anything that takes place in Europe, immediately explained is because we are allowing the Jews to live among us, which resulted in concept. If there is a, a plague, they go and attack the Jewish communities and have pogroms against the Jews. If there is any type of economic difficulty, they blame the Jewish uh, individuals. If there's a failure in war, Likewise, constantly blaming the Jewish person because, again, they have interpreted theologically that way. The Muslims, again, Ahl al-Kitab, they are protected. We have differences in religious discourse, but we have, we say some of them are good and some of them have what you call uh, bad. So, in essence, we give it a fair balance and we never actually uh, uh, said that we can't live with those who, don't, who are not Muslims. And again, the history is very important because when they speak to us, they project European history on the Muslim world. That's their history, that's not our history. All right? The Inquisition is European history, is not our history. The pogroms in Russia, in Poland, in Hungary is their history, not our history. The Crusades are their history, not our history, even though that it came to us. Every time the Crusaders pass through a village, a town, an area that they found Jewish population, they massacred them. Then when they arrived in Palestine, they killed Muslims, Jews, and Eastern Christians because they were the wrong type of Christians because they lived with the Saracens, lived with the Muslims. Yeah, so it's very important for us to understand that Zionism is born out of European history, not Jewish Arab history, right? There were Jews that are Arabs, meaning their language is Arabic, culture is Arabic, their engagement were Arabs, right? They did not have the same experience. That's very important. Third, Zionism undertook the project as a colonial project, right? So, uh, as Herzl begin his campaign, he writes a, uh, a letter to Cecil Rhodes. Cecil Rhodes was the minister of colony in uh, Great Britain, and we always have to say, Alhamdulillah, Great Britain is no longer great, because only Allah is great. Right? So again, they claim something that doesn't belong to them, and God have shrunk them as a result of it. Right? So Herzl writes a letter, he says, why do I turn to you in such a matter? because it is something colonial. Herzl understood that the project cannot happen or cannot be undertaken unless it is a colonial project. So he adopts a colonial project and becomes a junior partner in Great Britain. Now, at the time of the birth of Zionism, this also was the high point of colonization of Africa and other parts of Asia. So the general discourse, basically all the global south people had no status, they're subhuman. 1884-85, the uh, Paris conference, which was called the Scramble for Africa. 
where they sat around a round table to divvy up parts of Africa. So Zionism is a colonial project. And the colonial project did not have the rights of the indigenous people in their mind. They're just impediment that needs to be swept away. Great Britain has its own interest. And I'll get to that in relations to why Great Britain wanted to uh, adopt this project. So Zionism is a settler colonial project. Herzl in his diaries literally begins the process saying we need to throw away the Palestinian out to spirit the penniless population across the boundaries or across the borders. That was from the early period of Zionism, meaning transferring ethnically cleansing Palestine. So from the get-go, Zionism thought about removing the population. That is also not unique. I know people, when you talk to them about Palestine, they make it complicated, right? Like making, making a dish of food is complicated. So you have to get all the ingredients, especially if you're going to put all the spices together. That's complicated. There is nothing complicated about understanding colonization. There's two varieties. There is a colony with a motherland, like what Great Britain was, India, Egypt, uh, Kenya, different places, where extract resources and have the labor to work for the motherland. France with uh, Algeria, Senegal, Mali, Cote d'Ivoire, right? Extract resources, have the population work for you. The other type is settler colonization, where a settler population comes, they commit genocide or transfer. In America, we did both, right? In this region, genocide of the indigenous population and the remaining were transferred into reservation. Just that's the, that's the clear process that undertake, undertaken by colonial powers. So Zionism was thinking in the same way because they emerged out of European thought. Right? European thought, again, that the indigenous population has no value. You could shift them. And during that period was the height of death and destruction for much of the world. India, 15 million with the British being wiped out. King Leopold of uh, Belgium, half of the population of the Congo completely uh, uh, massacred. Uh, France in Algeria, a total of 8 million Algerians from in the 332 years. Right? So again, that was the process of colonization. So Zionism was born as a colonial state or a, as a colonial project linking up with Great Britain and participating in thinking that they will get a country. Now, Palestine was not the first place they wanted, or at least that was not the first place they considered. They considered Ethiopia. There were discussions of possibly Argentina. So the notion that Palestine, because we're going back to our home, that was a convenient post-creation of the state. That was the logic. Most of the writing early on was speaking about colonization and how to colonize Palestine, and how to bring settlers, and build settlers, and build a state on the basis of colonial discourse. So it's a very, very important to understand this. Fourth, the Western world, which we saw today and these days, they're, you know, mashallah, their human rights record is so bright that you just want to sit and eat it with your, you know, next time, hummus and human rights of Western world. Right? So the Western world was looking for its own interests. Great Britain wanted to think about how to secure all the pillaging that they were getting from India. Right? The British took from India about $45 trillion worth of wealth. Because when they came to India, it was 23, 24% of the world GDP. When they left after stole everything, including all the diamonds that the queen was wearing and all the scepter, all that is just from India and Africa. They reduced it to 3%. So they wanted to secure the trade from India through the, Mediterranean, through the Red Sea and the Suez Canal when they opened it in 1869. How to secure it? So thinking of a buffer state. All right? A buffer state meaning to try that will be holden to uh, Great Britain, 
and at the same time dismantling the Ottomans, because that was also one of the major projects. Europe at the time was thinking of the Jewish question, anti-Semitic question, and the Eastern question, which is the Ottoman question, also racist question. So in their plans of how to secure the area that came to be known as Palestine, so they were engaging in machination for their own best interest to secure the trade from India through the Red Sea, Suez Canal to the Mediterranean. Even the term Middle East gets to be introduced by the British from their India office. There was no such thing. If you went to people in 19, uh, 1902, 1904, 1910, 1915, tell them I'm going to the Middle East, they had no idea what you're talking about. Even up to the 1970, if you tell people I am from the Middle East, nobody in the Middle East says I'm from the Middle East. I'm from Egypt, I'm from Palestine, I'm from Syria. So the British, from their India office, came up with the plan for the Middle East because they had the policy, Far East, China, Japan, Korea, and so on, Far East. Then Middle East, which is the road between their India uh, uh, colony and Britain. And then the Near East, which is at the coast of the Mediterranean that include Egypt and the coast of Palestine, right? So their plan again, Far East, Middle East, uh, Near East, were all framed around this colonial discourse. And the United States picked it up later on, but still in the US uh, foreign policy, if you, the State Department does not have a Middle East desk, it has Near East desk. Even though they go testify in the, in the Congress, they speak about the Middle East, but their apparatus is actually speaks of Near East. Both are designation from outside, not from from the people themselves. And so very important that the British were thinking of their own interests, economic interests, political interests, strategic interests, as a way of making sure whatever they stole from India can pass and go through the Suez Canal, which is still the most, one of the most strategic spots on the world. There's two or three strategic spots in the world. The Suez Canal, Bab el-Mandib, which is at the gate of the Red Sea, and the Strait of Hormuz. Those are called the choke points of the world because trade, especially in energy, passes through this, uh, through these choke points, as well as overall trade. Suez Canal is about 14% of the world trade passes through the Suez Canal. Right? I know that people like to go to Panama and take pictures of the Panama Canal. It's actually tangential to global trade because the amount of ships that passes through is very narrow, very small compared to these super uh, big uh, uh, ships that have to navigate, uh, they, no, not, they can't cross the, 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 uh, the Panama Canal. So, so the British were designing from their own colonial interest of maintaining some hold for their own trade and facilitating both acquiring territory and also from Great Britain heavily anti-Semitic to get rid of the Jewish population. Balfour was heavily anti-Semitic. He issued the Balfour Declaration, heavily anti-Semitic. And also we're thinking of issues that comes into millenarianism, into thinking in a crusader term. So when the British entered Palestine on December 10, 1917, the newspapers in England said, this is the end of the Crusades. We came back after 672 years. That's the front page in the British press. And the uh, movies, or the uh, movies at the time in the military, they were actually speaking of how they're reenacting or participating in the Crusades, remembering the Crusaders that came. It is not us who don't, what you call, try to recall the Crusades, it's they have not forgotten and came back with that Crusader mentality. So there is a deep sense of this resentment, this constant, uh, antagonism toward Muslim and Islam in that way. So we see it that in Great Britain. Number five item. The Zionist movement itself is a reform movement toward Orthodox Judaism. Orthodox Judaism was based on the scripture, the uh, old, uh, the uh, Torah, following the guidance and waiting for the Messiah, right, uh, to arrive and to uh, take the Jewish population back into 
uh, Palestine and into as a religious uh, uh, arrival. Zionism is a modern movement adopting nationalism and using power right, as a way to birth, to give birth to the state and they rationalize it is preparing the ground for the arrival of the Messiah. So in essence, they said that Zion is going to rise, not by means of the book, but by means of the sword. So Zionism itself is a nationalist, modern reformist movement that set aside traditional Judaism, right? in order to arrive at a state as the object or the focal point of birthing a new Jewish person and a new Jewish society. Up to 1945, just before World War II, most of the Jewish populations around the world were anti-Zionist. So if you really want to read some, some strong materials and critique of Zionism, just go to some of the early writings of Jewish thinkers prior to the World War II, right at the entry of World War II, they were some of the strongest critics of Zionism because in essence, it set aside all of the Jewish tradition that have survived for 3,000 plus years and adopted modernity and adopted power. All right, so again, and there where we get uh, revisionist Zionism, especially with Jovetensky, uh, who basically says that you need to build an iron wall and you need to have a benefactor that will uh, bring you or provide the support for you. And he says that there is no way to have a reconciliation with the Arabs. It's not possible. He said it's impossible. And therefore, he did not want, he literally said that if you want to play a colonization, you have to dispense with the idea of reconciling with the indigenous population, meaning the Palestinians. Why, why Jepetensky is important? Because Netanyahu's father is the editor and the uh, uh, person who collected the papers uh, and one of the major followers of Jepetensky. So Netanyahu is committed to that line and committed to not actually have uh, any reconciliation with the Arabs and continues to be that uh, form in terms of his discourse. So that's uh, item five. Item six. When we speak about the history of Palestinians, right, in the modern period and so on, Palestine was a very diverse society, very well uh, developed. Uh, even at the time of the late Ottomans, very well developed and had political consciousness, uh, political organizing, uh, very vibrant society, educational institutions, right, from early on. And we see this again in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that the Palestinian society was really very well situated, right, in all aspects, all, all, all indications. They had they faced overwhelming challenge, but that challenge, again, as a result of a multi-factors that led to their dispossession. 1948 is an important juncture for the Palestinians because that is the dismantling of Palestinian society built at, or emerges after a period of uh, rebellion that took place from 1936 to 1939. There was a massive revolt where both the Zionists and the British confronted and literally targeted the Palestinians. As a result of that period, the Zionists began to de develop what's called village uh, files to identify who are the leaders, who are the people that were actually uh, organized, or who are the people who are committed to uh, political uh, uh, advocacy and organizing, and those files were developed so immediately as the war of 1947-48, they systematically targeted the Palestinians in the villages, uh, the leadership, through a whole host of structured violence, including assassination, bombings, uh, massacres, right, 
During that period, about 110 massacres that, were do that are documented. Uh, the uh, largest of it is in the hundreds, and the smaller of it is in the tens to twenties. So 120 massacres systematically that were predominantly with the Palestinians. It's a village structures and led to the flight and the escape of Palestinians, which is normal. Every civilian population confronted with massacres, usually they flee at the time of war to return. So in 1948, uh, 47, 48, it begins in December 1947 and culminates at the end of 48, uh, 750,000 Palestinians get to be ethnically cleansed, systematically, based on village files, but also based on massacre structured violence. Emptying whole cities, uh, especially in the coastal area up north, up south. So when you speak about Gaza today, 90% of Gaza population are refugees from 1948. 90%. So meaning that the children of the refugees, 48, are the ones that are being killed right now, or the grandchildren. Right? Because they were ethnic cleansed, and all their properties were taken over. So Israel actually, when, they, when some of these uh, individuals say that Israel made the desert bloom, no, no, they took Palestine fully furnished. It's like uh, renting an apartment or a house fully furnished with the gardens that are flowering with all types of vegetables. Palestine was never a desert. There's a desert in the south, but Palestine was one of the most uh, intensely cultivated areas in the world. And we have the evidence from the Zionists themselves, because they sent somebody in the early part of the 20th century to visit a document, and he says, the, he actually used a, an analogy, he said, the bride is beautiful, but is already betrothed. Meaning that Palestine is a beautiful country, and it's already have its people. All right? you, he said there isn't a spot, except that there is already people are cultivating. It's the land of milk and honey, in the biblical text, so what makes a land of uh, milk and honey all of a sudden in 1948 or 1950 as the Zionist propaganda and many of their spokespeople, we made the desert bloom? No, you took it fully furnished. You took houses that are fully furnished. You took vineyards that are fully uh, uh, cultivatable, uh, lemon uh, groves, uh, apricot groves, olive groves, completely. Right? So the 750,000 were expelled, ethnically cleansed, living in refugee camps, and in their place, all their properties were taken over. Even, I know that there's a movie about Golda Meir coming, she's a, a thief. She actually took the house of a prominent Palestinian family in Jerusalem and lived in it. Right? And they're trying to make her into a hero in Hollywood. That's why, again, Malcolm X is correct. If you don't pay attention, the media will make, actually flip the history. So they make the victim, right, be the, the uh, villain, and make the villain being the victim, and you actually will identify him. So Golda Meir is a thief. Took the property of a, of a family, lived in it, right, and without any remorse whatsoever. And now they're trying to uh, shove her down our throat that she is this magnanimous figure uh, at this particular time. So uh, 750,000. Now that population, their grandchildren, is about 5.2, uh, 5.5 million, right? those refugees. In Israel itself, there's a group of people that you don't find any designation equal to it in anywhere. If supposedly during the war, uh, as the war ended, you are not allowed to move to where you were at. You have to stay where you were at the end of the war. So supposing that there was a war in here. I live in Berkeley and I came in here in Pleasanton. All right? The war ended. I can't go back to my house in Berkeley. I have to stay in here. So I become an Israeli citizen. So I'm present in the state, absent from my property. And the state considered me an absentee, so I can't claim my, pro my property is distributed. There's about 200,000 in Israel, Israeli Arab Palestinian citizens, they're present absentee, absentee. I have not seen any categorization of such people anywhere in the world. That you're a citizen, you just got caught, the war took place, so you stayed where you are. And therefore, you are not allowed to go back and take your property. The property was taken and given 
to a newly arriving settlers. And so that's very important in terms of the uh, 1948 because that is the crux of the issue because most of the refugees in the West Bank, most of the refugees in uh, uh, Gaza, most of the refugees in Lebanon are from the 1948. There are some refugees from 1967 that moved. Jordan has a larger number of the 1967 uh, refugees. But the Gaza, Lebanon, and in the West Bank, these were refugees that uh, 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 were ethnically cleansed in 1948. So what you find is that during the uh, ethnic cleansing, think of the city of San Francisco equal number, a little bit, maybe less. Everything in the city is taken, taken away by a new group of people. From the sidewalk, to the schools, to the bank accounts, to the cars, to uh, the furniture, to the food, everything was taken by a new group, and the people were completely not allowed back in. Right, so that's the 1948 uh, eviction that takes place uh, in, in that way. Now the second uh, or the seventh point that I wanted to make is that the basis of the two-state solution is based on Resolution 181, United Nations Resolution 181. The United Nations Resolution 181 stipulated that will be uh, two states uh, to, be cre to be formed, one Arab uh, state, they didn't say Palestinian, so again, Israel has often wanted to erase the term pa uh, Palestine, and one uh, Jewish state. In the one, Resolution 181, the Jewish state was allocated 56%. The Arab state was given 43% uh, uh, or thereabout, and Jerusalem is to be an international zone. Now that's the division, 56%, right, 43%, and 1% of Jerusalem, give or take. What is important is in 1948, just before the war, Palestinians have ownership of 96% of the land. Some put it at 93%. So 93% of the land was owned by Palestinians. Yet they were given by the United Nations, who they were not a member of, 43%. Uh, Most of the coastal area of the Mediterranean was not allocated to them. Right? So the Palestinian, rightly so, somebody is taking their land, giving it to an external population that at the time was only 35% of the population arriving in only in the last 10 years. All right? So. When Balfour issued the declaration in 1917, Jewish population in Palestine is about 3%. So all the population really after, in the middle of uh, World War II and after World War II that the population increases and so on. So the allocation on Resolution 181 was injurious to the Palestinians because it took their land and their property away and allocated to uh, the uh, uh, Jewish uh, state to be, and the resolution itself was a general assembly resolution. And without the United States pressuring states, the resolution would not actually have passed. Because the United States mounted extensive pressure to make for the resolution to, to, uh, to be voted upon, and threatened the Philippine government with withdrawing their uh, foreign aid, because the Filipino ambassador actually the day before gave one, gave one of the best like anti-colonial speeches. They recalled him and sent another ambassador to cast the vote in favor of the resolution. So even the machination, like we see today in terms of uh, the countries gathering and so on, and the United States is basically uh, engaging in not only lobbying for Israel, but representing Israel. So whenever you have a peace, gathering, you're actually not only speaking with Israelis, but the United States is basically their lawyer. The United States says it's an honest broker. It's a broker, but honestly have nothing to do with it. All right? So from the get-go, the resolution itself was injurious uh, to the Palestinians, uh, taking and removing 
considerable of uh, part of their properties uh, at the time. And also machination with other Arab countries around to make sure that a Palestinian state does not emerge. Which gets me to my eighth point. The Arab world that we deal with and the Muslim world is a post-colonial world. Most of the political systems that are there are literally the ones that were either birthed or put in place by colonial powers. Uh, at that time, immediately after the 1948 uh, war, Palestinians had a gathering in Gaza and declared independence. The uh, Jordanian, uh, uh, at the time, uh, Prince Abdullah, gathered some of the dignitaries and had a meeting in Jericho and called on them to declare that they want to be unified with Jordan. Not known to people that Prince Abdullah was coordinating with the Zionists because the Jordanians have signed an agreement with the Zionists as early as 1922. There's a book that you need to uh, read, Collusion Across the Jordan River which looks at the collusion of the World Zionist Organization with the Jordanian, because the Jordanian state is a bur literally was formed by the British and appointed the prince by the British, similarly as the uh, kingdom in Iraq uh, appointing Faisal. Uh, so there was coordination and signing that they were recognized a Zionist state as early as 1922. Right, so again, to understand, so a prevention of emergence of a Palestinian state occurred as a result of this. King Farouk, likewise, was heavily in debt in Egypt and was not interested. Actually, the Egyptians had a revolution after the war, specifically because they sent the Egyptian army to the front uh, with faulty weapons. Like some of the weapons actually were shooting backward. All right? So all of the free officers with Nasser emerged as a result of failure and being double-crossed on the Egyptian front, they came back and had the revolution of 1953 against uh, uh, King Farouk at the time. So the Arab world is a post-colonial world. It all is cutting its deal, sometimes on top of the table, sometimes inside, under the table, and sometimes in the Sheraton Hotel. Right? So literally, any time that the Palestine cause, you have many of these players that are looking for their own interests. And we see the discussions today. Uh, I believe that uh, Biden visit, he was supposed to be in Jordan, right? For a meeting with the Egyptians, Jordanians, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and uh, the Americans. I think the deal was already being cooked, that there's possibly a forgiving of the Egyptians' debt, the Jordanian debt, and they will divvy up a number of Palestinians with them and basically try to uh, resolve Israel problem by taking part of uh, the problem of Israel's hands. The fact that the bombing of the hospital took place scuttled everything. So again, they were not planning on it. And Abbas, all indications he's ready to continue because he's an employee of the Israelis and the Americans. Just There's no two ways about it. He, his salaries are guaranteed, his security is guaranteed by the Americans and the Israelis, and he does not see uh, that anything other than his priority to maintain uh, his own uh, seat of power. So the Arab world is a post-colonial world. Its interest is vested with maintaining its relationship with U.S. and European powers. Most of their economies are connected to uh, U.S. and European powers. And Palestine is a problem that they would like to see go away, not by bringing justice to the Palestinians, is if we can get rid of it, we could move to more important things. And literally, you could see when uh, MBS had the interview with Fox, is basically, it's not a major issue, all right? There are far more important things, especially, you know, catching up and playing video games were far more important, right, in the interview, and all indications that they were moving in a normalization direction. The, the hiccup was on what type of security arrangements for Saudi Arabia, indication that Saudis were asking for nuclear power, and the Israelis don't want to have a nuclear power in terms of Israel, uh, in terms of Saudi Arabia, 
Uh, but the agreement was there for them to have an alternative uh, uh, canal that will connect part of the Red Sea uh, to the Mediterranean, which will kill the uh, Suez Canal for Egypt. And then Saudi Arabia will redirect much of its energy uh, transport through this new canal. Just maybe it will be less uh, costly for them. Uh, but in general, that was the move taking place from Arab countries. So Arab countries and Muslim countries were literally engaging in uh, their own best interests in a post-colonial uh, way. And if Saudi Arabia was normalizing, there are a number of other countries that would have come and they will put it under the banner that Islam won peace, right? Even though it's a piece of your land, but they don't tell you that. But that's the framing that Saudi Arabia would sign and they will bring possibly Bangladesh. There was a heavy pressure on Pakistan to possibly indicate, engage in normalization. And there are some small circle in Pakistan that is what you call desiring to do so. Uh, so a number of countries would have been brought in uh, into this into this discussion. So to understand what is taking place is literally about the machinations in the region, uh, about positioning Israel as the uh, important state where everybody would be, in essence, under Israel's protection, but Israel as the hegemonic power uh, in the region where the Palestinians will be, again, uh, sidesteps uh, or dispensed with in this planning. So the last part I want to say is centering Palestinian narrative. You cannot engage in discussions about Palestine without actually asking the Palestinians themselves what they have been through, what's their history, what is their suffering, what do they want, right? Because everybody is ready to offer what they want, right? But without asking what do the Palestinians want. Again, people are welcome to speak about the religious significance of Palestine. Alhamdulillah, that's, that's important. But when it deals about the specificity of Palestine, we don't want amateur hours. And amateur hours, people actually put their own desires of their own thinking about what they think is good for them rather than thinking of what the Palestinians want. So again, for those who don't know, Palestine wants freedom, wants justice, wants dignity, want to go back to their homes and lands. It's not very complicated. We still have, people still have the keys to their houses today, right? Because they left and they thought there'd be a few weeks and they're coming back to their homes. They still have the keys to their homes, right? From 1948. And the people are being bombed today, they know where their houses is, right? Or their houses are, so they just across, across the valley, all these villages that are emptied, right? So again, Palestinians want freedom, want justice, want dignity, and want to return to their homes. It's not complicated. Actually, international law is on their side. There's a resolution 194 in the United Nations that says that people have the right to go to their homes. International law correctly says that this is the right of the people to uh, return to their homes and their lands. Uh, we don't hold civilians responsible for whatever conflict takes place. Civilians escape at a time and they go back to their homes. So that's a very, very important uh, to understand uh, what the Palestinians want and how to begin if you want to help. These are the issues that Palestinians ask you to help and advocate for. As we're seeing Gaza, to conclude with this, uh, these are acts of genocide. There is no other ways. This is genocide taking place. You don't need to kill everyone in the society for genocide. Right? Genocide has many layers to it. Uh, again, I just want to read maybe in here the, the genocide convention. I have it handy. <laughs> All right, because uh, people just these days, uh, right, so the Convention on Genocide, the Crime of Genocide, Article, Article 2 of the Convention, oh, one second, hopefully we'll get, uh, so Article 2, this is Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, Article 2, uh, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Forcefully transferring children of the group to another group. The following acts shall be punishable. Genocide. Conspiracy to commit genocide. Direct 
and public incitement to commit genocide. I charge the media in this country and the Western world of incitement to commit genocide. Right? It makes a 70-year-old man who three weeks before builds a tree house for the child to go up and get a knife and stab the child 26 times. Wadiya. Bayumi in, in Chicago. That's incitement. Right? Where the day before they inciting, there is a global day of jihad. Nobody told anybody it's a global day of jihad. They translated and translated the speech from someone and put it that is a call internationally. So everybody was the FBI in alert, right? That's incitement. And I would say also the president is inciting as well for committing genocide. Right? So direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Israel has a right to defend itself. Bombing apartment building, that's defending yourself. Bombing a hospital, defending yourself. Bombing churches, defending yourself. The second oldest Roman Catholic church in the world is there. Been under Muslim, uh, living within Muslim for 13, 1400 years. Not a stone is touched. Right? It's bombed. What, what type of target is this? Right? So again, incitement, direct and public incitement. Attempt, attempt to commit genocide and complicity in genocide. The United States is complicit in genocide. Germany is complicit in genocide. Canada is complicit in genocide. Italy is complicit in genocide. Britain and France are complicit in genocide. They just met yesterday and issues a despicable, atrocious type of statement right? in relations to supporting Israel's action, bombing, building, and bombing people in their houses. Right? Yesterday, about 536 individuals killed. They still have 1,500 under the rebels, civilians. Right? I have no problem if you want to fight a military, a military person, a guerrilla force, go, go and fight them. But you have no right to actually bomb uh, uh, almost half of the buildings, half of the houses in Gaza today have been damaged. Over 51% of all the houses damaged. Most, all, almost 1.6 million out are living out in the open. We're already about 2,300 kids that have been killed. Just to give you a comparison, if it's the same percentage ratio to the United States, it would be equal to 270,000 kids being killed in a matter of two weeks. Just to understand the ratio, 2,300 relative to the Population 2.3% or 2.3 million, if you project it to the United States population, you're talking about almost 270, 275,000 kids killed between October 7th and now. And yet people are not asking for a uh, ceasefire or whatsoever. And more so the United States is sending troops. I put on Twitter, can somebody ask, answer the question, why is Israel war on Gaza now is an American war on Gaza? Why is Israel war on Gaza? Is an American war on Gaza? What is the strategic, again, from a real politique? What is the U.S. interest in the war in Gaza? You already have the oil. You already have all the monarchies pumping oil as much as you want. They're buying all the things, the junks, and bringing Shakira next week to have a concert in Riyadh. You already have your cake and eating it. So what is it in Gaza that you make it as part of the strategic need for everyone, and you're going to deploy U.S. troops? As for American, you're, again, you're an American voter. What is, what is the strategic interest? Why is it our war? Why is it that we have to ship billions? We're already shipping billions to, to Israel. Why is it that we have to ship some more? Again, those are questions that we have to ask. So again, the United States is committing, is being complicit in acts of genocide while sending, they're asking for 15 billion, possibly more, and Biden wants us to be happy that he's sending 100 million. So you bomb them with 15 billion and you send band aid or 100 million. It's like an insult to intelligence. I'd rather for him not to send anything rather than you say in Arabic, like all of a sudden say, I gave you 100 million. MashaAllah. Really, we have to be people that just, you know, we have to have self respect. Keep your money. Uh, we understand where you are. And I'm telling people if you're going to vote next time, I'm not voting Biden. Biden, you could go take a suntan. You are not getting a vote from the Muslims. As far as I'm concerned, I'm going to go and uh, campaign against him in Michigan, in Georgia, in, in New Jersey, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania. And good luck. 
Are you going to say Trump is worse? Well, again, uh, I, as far as I, I could see, it's two, it's the uh, same face on the coin in terms of how you no lack of respect for Muslims. And unless you respect the Muslims both in here and our issues, we're not interested in just coming with distorted Arabic and say, Assalamu alaikum, I like falafel and chicken tikka masala. That day is over. There is a pre genocide and post genocide. We are in, right now in a genocide and we have to actually act and deal with circumstances accordingly. So, Jazakumullah khair for listening. Okay, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, I know the last part you said that, you know, we, we all Muslims have ran to uh, Biden and, and her. What, what options do we have now to vote for? Well, I think uh, locally, you still have to engage locally because you need to still do the local. But on the national level, I do think that we need to send a clear message that you cannot take our vote our donations, our engagement for granted, and no matter who the community. And more so that he incited against the Muslims mm -hmm. uh, in a way that resulted in the massive Islamophobia that just uh, blew up all over the place. So I put the responsibility of Wadi' on him and his messaging that basically inflamed the passion rather than, again, hugging Israel is like a a uh, pastime sport in America, right? So everybody says, I'm towards it. You could, whatever, if you want to do that, do that. Okay, I'm standing with Israel. You know, they're fighting, whatever. But the way that they messaged it made the passions in here against Muslims and translated into uh, the crimes that unleashed and killed uh, the little six years old yeah. guy. Yeah, kid. Islamophobia is on the rise. So are, are we organizing in a way that we can identify who the <coughs> candidates we're, are? We're working. We're have, we do have the, the Muslim organization, the large 14 national organizations. We just had a couple of meetings. We're still trying to strategize in terms of what our responses would be. But definitely we're sending a message that we're not for Biden 2024. Thank you. Brother Hatim, thank you very much for being here tonight. Oh, you're uh, welcome. I appreciate that. Uh, the question that I have is uh, it's, uh, more general. Why the academic me, uh, the intellectual, the people that they used to, to come and talk about the correctness of these things, I, why they're not there? Why they're not talking? Why they're so quiet? <coughs> well, the university have been transformed into almost a corporate entity. So there is, the university is heavily dependent on donors. There is less and less uh, public funding going to education. So it responds more to big donors. That's one part of this equation. The second is the university has become the site of uh, cultural wars. Uh, and people don't want to be in the middle of these cultural wars because you speak, immediately you're going to be uh, doxxed, you're going to find your fox all over you, CNN. So people are hesitant to engage in this. And the third, there is a systematic campaign by pro-Israel organization, by uh, legal warfare, uh, by Stand With Us, to target every faculty member uh, with all kinds of harassment. Uh, you know, uh, calling for freedom of information, to collect all their emails, respondents, so people begin to be very careful uh, in doing so. And uh, that's narrowing the arena for the ability of scholars to come out and speak. And I may add also the, the, the phenomena of the social media makes influencers uh, far more important than intellectuals, right? And that's the calamity because influencers, what is that category? What have they, what research is there other than having a cat that jumps faster and you have a video for one and a half minute and garners a million uh, views and they throw a statement about Palestine. So that's a calamity that we are in. Any questions on this? <coughs> Dr. Hatim. 
if you could leave us with three action items, three things we can do to support our brothers and sisters in Gaza, uh, we would really appreciate that. One, I would uh, ask people to every day call the White House. Just as you get up to get your coffee, tea, or cereal, call the White House. And you could, I think the number is, let me see, I have it on my phone, I got it in the morning. Uh, just give them, you know, a minute of your time. Uh, our opposition does it, and they get the response. So, uh, uh, 202. Uh, four five six one four one four. So if you could commit in the morning, just call the White House. So that's one to do. Second, I want you to actually call your mayor and your council member, because they have immediate influence and link to the Democratic Central Committee or the Republican Central Committee. That's very, very, very important because all politics is local. Their statement about Supporting Israel is a right to defend itself is contingent on your local engagement uh, here with them in a systematic way. The third, I do think that they proactively begin to think about how to educate yourself about the specifics by maybe having a reading group or reading a book and discussing the specifics of Palestine because it's information heavy. Uh, cause this cannot be done with what you call a watching the videos on tic, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. So those three items will be very important. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Um, so I know for a lot of folks, um, what we're seeing over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, it's similar stuff that we've seen before as well, and yeah. repeatedly and such as well, and that can be very demoralizing as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind sharing maybe some things that give you hope um, when it comes to uh, seeing a future? Yeah. Well, I always trust in Allah. That's right. If you trust in the world, the world is always going to be changed. Allah is Al Adl. I believe that Allah is all the all just. Right. Even if you're alone, you're not alone because Allah is with you wherever you are. We take with the asbab, but our trust is Allah is the dispossessor of all the affairs. Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim, and Al-Adl. So you always have to put in your mind that we are in the realm of the divine. And no matter what happened, we believe that we are in a better place no matter what the circumstances, whether alive, or we hope that if we die, we are at least in the divine presence. So for me, that's for us to, as a grounding. The second, you should have a habit of turning off the uh, news feed that you have, right? And I do think that people begin to be addicted because they think that the more news you consume of what's taking place, that the more you are aware. I don't think so. Especially with the social media, just people begin to be over, uh, uh, over uh, what you call saturated, and you're not actually getting more sound information. And as you notice, they just continue to repeat, repeat, so you begin, part, you begin to be part of a loop. So get the news, what is it, 10, 15 minutes time, and then separate yourself, go and read, drink tea, right? Just do something that you are not affecting the world by watching more news. It becomes a way what you call uh, almost a, a form of entertainment on the news, even though it is uh, sad news and so on. So I recommend for people not to spend the hours, right, in, in doing so. And the third, just do a routine of moving, right, walking and so on, so you not get sad or absorbed in the circumstances that are taken, which are, you know, overwhelming. Uh, but uh, this is the world we are in. The world is a world of tribulation. And we are just experiencing the period of uh, tribulations in, not only in Palestine, but the Muslim world. Uh, the Duke University, uh, 
institutes that uh, since 9-11, about 4.7 million Muslims uh, have been killed uh, in the wars of terrorism. Uh, whether are talking about Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, Sudan, uh, Yemen, uh, Somalia. Right? You're talking about 4.7 in a 22-year period. So, yeah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to transform our condition and bring ease to, to the ummah, insha'Allah. That's okay. That's my son, Ihsan. Assalamu How old are you, Ihsan? Okay, mashallah. He's a very strong uh, supporter of Palestine. Alhamdulillah. You know, um, <clears throat> when this issue first started, you know, in my chat group, there was um, a little bit of a discussion. You know, the discussion was around a uh, California state senator who, and I don't recall specifically what they said, but they didn't oppose, um, I think they kind of stood with Israel. Well, not necessarily. I think they may have said something around, like, they... They condemn any killing of all people. Um, and this was like the very start of this, this issue. So the debate was around whether or not we should continue to support her or not. Um, and part of the debate was, look, we can't put pressure on our Muslim, fellow Muslims who you know, go into politics and they're just starting out. Let's get much stronger and get a little bit more involved. Um, versus, you know what, we need, to, we need to put pressure on them as well to, 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 make a, to be our voice. Um, which in turn may cause them to lose their position later on. Hmm. So it was that type of debate, and I wonder where you would kind of stand. Uh, we have the same discussions with the faculty, yeah. right, in terms of the university. My feeling is that if you are not courageous starting, yeah. you're not going to be courageous later on. Because you become more comfortable where you are, and you take people for granted. We don't want people just to represent identity. We want courageous people because this is the moment or the period for courage, not only on Palestine, on a number of issues. Mm -hmm. right? uh, you need to be courageous in confronting the pharmaceutical companies that pushed opioid on people and resulted in the massive opioid uh, crisis. You know, Walgreens is indicted for pushing opioid. San Francisco, they have to pay $500 million fine uh, for pushing opioid, yeah. Walmart, uh, Duke, uh, Duke Pharmaceuticals, uh, the Sackler family, $26 billion, they pushed opioid from 1999 till now. Almost a million Americans died. And they can't you. If you go to San Francisco, people are just dying every day on the street. Needs courage for you to actually stand, to say, I'm not going to take any money from the pharmaceutical companies, and I want you to come and testify about how you allowed a doctor in a small town with 5,000 people to prescribe 80,000 pills a month. How is that possible? All right. So what we want is courageous people. Winning and losing is part of the reality of politics. If you are running and you're only worried about losing, you should not run. Because there is a set of principles that you have to actually stand by. And people respect people who stand on principle. As long as you explain where you are and what you're doing, and here's, here's my principles. Unfortunately, we have, again, Muslims, we're happy for identity, just if somebody is Muslim, but we don't take them to task for the courageous positions that they have to take. So for me, I fall on that I would rather for you to be principled rather than to be what you call uh, not courageous. Your opposition is basically in your face. And they take no prisoner. So the more that they know, in general for me, the more they know that you bite, the more they stay away from you. The more that they know that you are vacillating, they know that you are an easy lunch. For me, that's what I feel. I have a follow-up question. Is that okay? You yeah, okay? Last question for me. Um, right now, the, I mean, you're starting to see, and I don't know if everybody sees this, but there's a, a fair amount of shift where uh, a greater amount of the American population is learning more and more about Palestine and really what's going on there. Yeah. Is there a, a coordinated effort to kind of try to like, educate the American population more? Because the way I think is that the, their lack of knowledge is really driving a lot of the support for Israel. 
I think the American public are instinctively aware, like 66% of them are saying, calling for a ceasefire. Uh, in terms of the various data, it's only the older people that are still firmly in, uh, behind Israel. The younger population are actually the opposite. 56% are standing with Palestinians. Uh, and they no longer trust the mainstream media. So the more the stream media is actually speaking and taunting and bullying Palestinians, the more people are actually are not following nor are taking their story. And most of the social media uh, content that is coming from Palestine sources are being taken and acted upon. As far as an organized effort, we've been just active throughout the country, right? All these protests, demonstrations, we're mobilizing people across. This past Saturday, I was, Friday I was in New Jersey, Saturday in Washington, then flew down to LA. So people are mobilized in numbers that are unprecedented in terms of, the last time we have such people out in numbers were the anti-Iraq uh, war 2003. Uh, and it's at a global level. Like if you saw yesterday, the Saturday in London, almost a hundred, they say about 150 possibly in London. Uh, France, the French government uh, prohibited demonstrations. So people went out to the court. The court actually issued a uh, rebuke of the president. Even with the president prohibiting protests, thousands filled the, uh, uh, the Plaza de la Republic. You could not step a foot, which is a huge, huge turnout. So that shows you that there is a different dynamics taking place. And part of it, I read it, uh, I think Israel overreached in its violence. Uh, honestly, if Israel, not that they're following my recommendation, this is free <laughs> recommendation, if they just waited for two weeks and milked the sympathies of people, I think Palestinians would be in a very, very difficult position. If they just went, just waited two weeks, three weeks, came to Disneyland, did some Hollywood cuts and so on, I would say that there would not be possible to have a Palestine protest anywhere in this country or in Europe. But because they acted with immediate revenge and overwhelming power, it activated in people the sentiment that this is something wrong taking place. And I have never seen a shift in public opinion as fast and rapidly taking place as this case. In less than 48 hours from people having uh, Israeli flags on the Eiffel Tower, on Big Ben, on all, on the sports and so on, in 48 hours after the bombing, massive numbers out in the streets, people protesting and so on, and people beginning to step back. Right? Uh, this past weekend, the Premier League uh, were discussing whether to actually uh, have the Israeli colors being at the Wembley Stadium. They actually worried that the people reaction would be so negative, they decided not to do it. Right? That shows you that the shift that occurred in such a rapid uh, fashion is a result of Israel's failure to actually read the moment and to realize that this overwhelming power might appeal to the thugs, literally thugs, Bingavir, Smoltridge, and the rest of them in the Israeli cabinet, but the world public opinion is a completely different place. And I think they misread the signals from people and that's what we're seeing the outcome of it. <coughs> more questions, inshallah. Before Suhoor, so we'll take one more question and then I have to teach tomorrow, okay. early morning. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So, I, just to get your idea right now about the public change in the ideas and the small generation or the younger generation or the change the behaviors or the mentality related to Palestinian and Israeli concern. So my question here is how this affects the, the community here for the short and long term for your opinion. So if we stayed like this for three, five years, 
Is this anything going to change in terms of the politics here? Yeah. How about 15, 20 years from now? Or it's about the event that's happened this year? If I could answer your question about 20 to 30 years from now, they might give me $100 million on the spot. <laughs> no, but, but you are more academic than us so we yeah but no learn. academic can tell you what's going to happen in 30 years especially in the social science arena okay. uh, i could tell you what accumulatively happened in the past and maybe some positive avenues to look at in order for us to understand the change in public opinion is cumulative mm -hmm. right so it's a 30-year period that this change takes place as a result of many different elements both Palestine activist work, but also missteps of Israel and the United States. But your opinion is it's between Israeli and Palestinian concern or in terms of humanity issues here. Like now the American people look to this war between Muslims and Jews or between people they kill weak people like Israeli have a power and America stand with them and Europe stand with them and we have Palestinian people they don't have anybody with them are they just have this emotional for this just now or in the future we will have my son my kids will have a friendly environment to say hey we are Muslim and we stand with rights and we are supporting Muslim country, which is called Palestine, and they have rights for this. Yeah. I have two sons here. I, I know, but and I, I'm talking. I, I, I know, but I can't there. answer okay. to you about what's going to happen when they grow up and so on. It's how much work you do to effect change in order for you to create the environment and the country that you are in. I do believe that the American public overall is anti-war. They have to be stoked into war. And usually they get stoked and they join the fever for war. But as soon as it gets disastrous, they completely go back to an anti-war position. Right? We saw that in Iraq, and then it dragged on for 20 years. Uh, we saw that in Afghanistan, same thing. So entering war is very easy. Extracting yourself out of a war is very difficult. The United States have a long history of that. But the public has to be stoked, and that's why the role of the media to incite and stoke people to support an illegitimate war. In the United States, every illegitimate war, again, ended up being disaster, whether it's Vietnam all the way to Latin America's intervention and so on. So I think what we need is to do the work that is needed to continue to build on a public opinion that is shifting and to try to influence it for good policy, which I think is possible. The other element, there is a, a large segment of Jewish Americans that are leaving and abandoning Israel in their political work. Like Jewish Voice for Peace, the 500 that went to uh, Congress and got arrested just last uh, three days ago. Okay? That's a shift that has been in the making for quite a long time. And Jewish Voice for Peace initially started as a liberal pro-peace organization now it's an anti-Zionist organization. That shift took place over a period. So beginning 2018, 2019, they took a decision as a group to be anti-Zionist. So these are things that are accumulative and continue to invest in it will make change over time. Okay? Final question. Final question. I apologize. Um, so obviously we've seen the momentum every time happens, pick up, and then it dies down. Um, a suggestion and maybe also a question as well. Um, are there any coordinated efforts? I'm sure there are multiple platforms out there in which it's not just us Muslims who obviously have a very strong uh, sentiment to this pro out there protesting. Um, is there any platform in where there are other like these you know, guys yeah, who are going anti-Zionist Jews that we can align with. We, and we are. 
We are. So again, I, I'm the chairman of American Muslims for Palestine, so we coordinate closely with the GVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, and other organizations. We coordinate with the uh, Sabil, which is the voice of Christians that work on Palestine. We have a group of, uh, that works on Christian Zionism and how to dissect it and look at what's developing. So there is different groups that are coordinating and working together in a variety of ways uh, to push, and that result of it is these mass mobilizations. Yeah, some will take the lead on one thing, some will take the lead on another thing. So today and tomorrow in D.C. we have lo uh, Advocacy Day for Palestine through a, uh, American, Americans for Justice in Palestine action. So we have uh, people visiting their senator, congressmen, offices, uh, giving them, you know, what are the points that they want to advocate for. So this is taking place as we speak. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.